Hello there, my fellow nefarious masterminds, and welcome back to some 40k lore. In today's dose of Necromunda fluff, and part of my more recent Crime on Necromunda subtopic, we're actually gonna go over several interesting characters. What they have in common, well, they're all infamous criminals in one way or another. And before you say it, yes, I do know that most, if not all, characters I covered in my many Necromunda videos would count as criminals in a saner universe. But the ones we're learning about today are all out of the Necromunda Book of Judgment, so they do have that one thing in common. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The first of today's characters is Psyrena Scar. A gang needs to be truly desperate to hire Psyrena Scar. Unstable and unpredictable, she sells her fickle psychic gift to anyone willing to pay the price. Although there are no guarantees about what will happen when she opens her mind to the Immaterium. Even when attempting to suppress her powers, Cyrena is uncomfortable to be around. Always muttering to herself, arguing with her shadow, or telling those she just met how sorry she is about their passing. Cyrena was not always so broken, however. And not that long ago, she was a Holsteader's daughter working the ash waste below Dust Falls. One day, when digging in the furthest point of her Das Holstead, she found a strange ornate jar buried in the ash. It looked far too fine to have come out of the underhive, and so she took it back to her father, thinking they might be able to sell it for a good price. That evening, as the family sat around their rad hearth admiring the find, the jar mysteriously opened. Peering inside, they discovered a strange pinkish substance which was suffused with a fragrant smell. Cyrena's little brother was the first to scoop out a mouthful, and within moments the starving family was feasting upon the contents. Because eating the contents of a random jar, which that emperor knows how much in the waste, on a planet as poisoned as Necromunda, is obviously common sense in 40k. Unknown to the family, the relic was one of the lost jars of Moong, and the contents were the preserved brain of one Kukim Korlipin. Astropath of the Lost House of Mung. This oddity might have passed unnoticed by the family, if not for the latent psychic spark it awoke in Cyrena. Reflexively, she opened her mind to the Immaterium, and in that moment incinerated her family and her homestead in a single explosion of power. Ever since that day, she wanders the Underhive as an unsanctioned psyker, staying ahead of the law and selling her services to those more afraid of their foes than having a loose cannon like Psyrena around. The second of today's characters is Estes Jet. As Esmeralda, hold mother of the Dust Falls Deep Nine Orpharium, tells it, she found Jet under an overturned cart in the aftermath of what appeared to be a ratskin ambush on some green hivers. There was little left of the hivers, the area splattered in blood and body parts. The only clue to the child's identity was a collar around her neck and the only legible letters on it were E-S-T-S-U-G-E-T. -E Jet was taught all the skills she needed to survive by Esmeralda. These were skills all the girls of the Deep Nine learned, like how to break somebody's neck with a dropkick, the kill points on an Ash Devil, or how to tell the difference between a second best that will kill you and second best that will make you blind. The best of Esmeralda's girls could then expect good jobs as Gilder guards or hired guns with Gretz going back to Esmeralda, of course. Jet, however, decided to take another path. She used her talents to get in with the Archworks overboss Gideon Scav to become his right-hand woman. It wasn't long before Jet was running the racket of Gideon out of Dust Falls and moving shipments of counterfeit war gear and weaponry. This gave her ample opportunity to indulge in her favorite activity, which is killing idiots. She claims to sell the fastest bullets of the Underhive, and challenges any potential customers to prove her wrong. Unsurprisingly, between Jet yelling, run, and her squeezing the trigger, her claims have stayed intact. Obviously, she would sell even more bullets had she painted them all red. The third of today's characters is one Kor Koran, nicknamed Two Guns. In the Underhive, obesity is actually a sign of status. Massive chain lords, hulking crime bosses, or rotund guilders 
all display their wealth by proving not only to have enough to eat, but that they can actually eat to excess. Then there are those just like Kor, Tugans, Koran, who are simply fat, or big-boned, as he calls it. A clanless, gutter-born bullet scavenger from Dead and Pass, Kor probably wouldn't have amounted to much had it not been for a chance encounter with a ratskin shaman out in the bad zones. While hunting in the ash drifts for usable rounds, Kor came upon an ancient ratskin surrounded by slavering ripperjacks. In a rare moment of bravery and selflessness, Kor ran to the old man's aid, saving him from the ripper's jaws. In return, the shaman told Kor he had looked into his soul and seen that he was the offspring of a mighty hero of the Underhive and destined for greatness. Kor immediately made the leap of logic that the shaman could only be talking of none other than Bull Gorg, an ex-pitfighter and once overlord of Dead and Pass. Surely the hefty bull, with whom Kor undoubtedly shared a physique, had to be his father, and it was up to Kor to carry on the legacy of Bull's failed uprising. Unwilling to cut off his arms though and replace them with chainsaws like his quote-unquote father, Kor took up a pair of battered auto pistols instead earning him the nickname Two Guns, a nickname he actually just gave to himself. Allying himself with Balthazar's Black Network, he enthusiastically fights for the rights of the common people of Dead and Pass, and even made a name for himself as a rabble-rouser. The narco-lords are more than willing to placate Kor with promises that his jobs are in the spirit of Bull's Free Underhive, if it means that he continues to make life difficult for the Guilders. The next two characters are actually related, the duo Vander and Gain Gorvos. Vander Gorvos is part of the self-styled nobility of the Underhive. Decades ago, three crime families took over two tunnels, Drake's Gantry and the Greyway's Trading Post, and together they formed a triumvirate to rule over the three settlements and a dozen or so surrounding domes between the Dust Falls Drop and the Ash Gates Interchange. Against the odds, the families did not turn on one another or fall prey to criminal rivalry. Instead, they managed to endure until their children grew up to inherit the lands of their parents. The Gorvos family runs two tunnels alongside the Feybrun and Keorka clans, with Vander the heir apparent to the Gorvos line. Unfortunately for the Gorvos family, Vander is an idiot. Clad in under high finery, he genuinely believes that he is a hive noble. He apes any up high fashions or affectations he happens to learn about, and goes out of his way to antagonize guilders and enforcers who don't properly respect his position. Needless to say, he is universally despised, and has survived only by virtue of his lineage. Vander's sister, Gain, has been working for years to get rid of him. On the pretext of having him prove his noble superiority, Gain organizes alliances with local gangs whereby Vander will accompany them on business important to the family. So far, Vander has been hired out to many local factions, although to Gain's frustration, he has yet to get himself killed. It is definitely difficult to find entitled and spilled underhivers, given the crushing poverty and endemic violence of their surroundings, although they do exist. Thus, Gain, the gunk queen Gorvos, is one such anomalous individual. A pauper princess who rose to control the notorious Gorvos clan of the Two Tunnels Triumvirate. She shares some of her traits of a junk noble with her brother Vander, although unlike Vander she has no delusion about the world she inhabits. She knows the only way for the Gorvos clan to hold on to power is via fear and violence. That and getting rid of her stupid brother. While Vander swans about pretending to be Two Tunnels royalty, Gain is getting on with the business of making credits. It is not for her overuse of Muxcav's Mohawk Grease that Gain is called the Gunk Queen. One of Gorvos's major holdings is the Two Tunnels Gunk Tank, a great reserve of fermented runoff from Hive City which has kept the settlements in credits for centuries now. As the Gunk Queen, Gain makes it her personal mission to oversee the gunk trade and cracks down on anyone with designs on her turf. She often hires on gangs to oversee operations personally furnishing her companions with gunk rounds and gunk bombs if they run off the competition. More recently, she's been involved in a clandestine war with the crime boss Balthazar, who has his own designs on two tunnels. 
more than one of Balthazar's agents had gotten a first-hand look at the price their employer is trying to claim, as Gain personally drowns them in the gunk tank. The conflict would escalate as Gain's brother, Vander, has been, quite unwillingly, working with the gangs of Balthazar, forcing Gain to redouble her efforts to rid herself of her annoying sibling. Last but not least for today, we have Johnny Razor. John is one of the very few individuals to cross Balthazar von Zepp and live to tell the tale. A low street-level dealer from Gilder Crossing, John was absorbed by Balthazar's black network when the latter took over Dust Falls. Who was in charge of the local chem trade didn't mean a lot to a scrut like Johnny, and for a time he managed to avoid the attention of his betters. But then, one fateful day, Johnny unfortunately got in the way of the infamous Lofar Hex. Ordinarily such a mishap would have meant a free bolt round lobotomy. But on this day, Johnny accidentally stumbled out of a drinking hole and knocked Hex down, actually saving the killer from a sniper bullet. Dragged before Balthazar, Johnny would have likely still faced summary execution or ash blasting, if not for the presence of Erasmus the Mangler, Balthazar's resident rogue dog. The Mangler happened to be looking for a test subject, after he had acquired a broken murder servitor via the cold trade and wanted to see if he could graft its limbs to a live person. As Balthazar was in a rather good mood, he agreed, and Johnny was dragged off to see the mangler's operating table. Whether it was Erasmus's fear of failing Balthazar, or simply natural underhive hardiness, Johnny actually survived the operation, stumbling out of the dock workshop with a bladed cyber arm, a whirring bionic eye, and many internal upgrades. He took the name Johnny Razor for the dead in new appendage, and the scummer headed back to Gilder Crossing. Within a few cycles, he rose up in the ranks, due in no small part to the new gifts. It was also at this time that Johnny discovered his obedience organs that a mangler had put inside him, his own body rebelling against him if he tried to go against the narcolode's wishes. Nowadays, Balthazar loans Johnny out to gangs for extra muscle, and to show off the benefits and drawbacks of loyalty to the Black Network. And this, my fellow narco lords, has been what I wanted to tell you about these colorful characters and criminals of Necromunda for today. Personally, I found the story of Core Two Guns Coran to be the most entertaining and funny. You can share your thoughts on which character you found most interesting in the comments below as usual. As for future Necromunda videos, we still have at least two books to get through. The Book of the Outlands and the Book of Desolation. One of those even has a squad subfaction, which you can look forward to in the near future. If you found any of this informative or entertaining, do consider leaving a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot, and have a healthy and awesome day. The Emperor Protects.